Mr. President, it is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you and Mrs. Liu on behalf of our entire community. We are deeply honored that you have chosen to visit Yale. Your country has an ancient tradition of reverence for education, and your actions affirm this tradition. During the past decade, you have made massive investments in your universities, strengthening the most excellent of these institutions while broadening access to higher education for, uh, from less than 5% to more than 15% of your college age population. Your nation's focus on education has contributed substantially to your historically unprecedented success in lifting more than 200 million of your citizens out of poverty in the past quarter century. We admire these achievements and, like most Americans, we are hopeful that the development of your economy will be accompanied by continued expansion of the rule of law and strengthening of the rights of individuals. These past two summers, Yale has been privileged to host presidents and vice presidents from 14 of your leading universities for an intensive two-day seminar on the policies and practices of the world's most respected institutions. Our conversations have acknowledged deep differences on important questions of values and national policy. But we hold the common belief that only through education can one acquire the capacity to think creatively and independently, and thus contribute to scientific and material progress, as well as to the humanistic and artistic expression that enriches society. We also agree on the power of personal encounter to deepen mutual understanding among those who start from different traditions, norms, and values. Our experience mirrors that of thousands of US and Chinese scientists and scholars, and tens of thousands of students whose interactions with one another can be a foundation for a lasting peace between our nations. Yale's proud of its extensive collaborations with China. Scholars from our faculty of arts and sciences and faculty from nearly all of our professional schools are currently engaged in more than 80 research and educational collaborations with Chinese counterparts. In addition to our seminar for university leaders, we're currently involved in training programs for your environmental officials, mayors, senior executives of state enterprises, and senior governmental leaders. We're collaborating with Fudan and Peking universities on major scientific research programs, and with your alma mater, Tsinghua University, on both cultural and environmental projects. Our China Law Center, directed by Professor Paul Gewurz, who helped to orchestrate the Rule of Law Initiative, launched by Presidents Zhang Zemin and Bill Clinton, is deeply engaged with your, with your courts, your law schools, your administrative agencies, and the National People's Congress, helping to advance legal reform and the rule of law. Our American students are eager to learn about China. They learn from study. Enrollment in our first year Chinese language courses increased by more than 50% this year. And each time Professor Jonathan Spence offers his course in modern Chinese history, over 300 students enroll. And our students learn from encounter, from getting to know the more than 600 Chinese students and scholars currently in residence here at Yale, who teach even as they pursue their own studies. We look forward to your address, Mr. President. By your presence today, you honor the long association between Yale and China, and you honor the place of the university in both Chinese and American society. We are deeply grateful. 
Mr. President. Mr. Richard Levin, President of Yale University, dear students and faculty members, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking you, Mr. Levin, for your kind invitation and the opportunity to come to Yale. to meet young friends and teachers of this world-renowned university. Coming to the Yale campus with its distinctive academic flavor and looking at the eager young faces in the audience, I cannot but recall my great experience studying at Tsinghua University in Beijing 40 years ago. Indeed, what happens during one's school years will influence his whole life. I still benefit greatly from the instruction of my teachers and my interaction with other students. Yale is renowned for its long history, unique way of teaching, and excellence in academic pursuit. If time could go back several decades, I would really like to be a student of Yale, just like you. Yale's motto, Light and Truth, which is a calling for human progress, represents the aspiration of every motivated young man and woman. Over the past three centuries, Yale has produced a galaxy of outstanding figures, including 20 Nobel laureates and five American presidents. The words of Nathan Hale, an American hero and Yale alumnus, quote, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country, end of quote, have also inspired me and many other Chinese. I sincerely hope that Yale will produce more talent and contribute further to the social and economic development of the United States and to the cause of human progress. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the Chinese and Americans have always had an intense interest in and cared deeply about each other. The Chinese admire the pioneering and enterprising spirit of the Americans and their proud achievements in national development. As China develops rapidly and a steady headway is made in China-US cooperation, more and more Americans are following with great interest China's progress and development. Understanding leads to trust. Today, I would like to speak to you about China's development strategy and its future 
against the backdrop of the evolution of the Chinese civilization and China's current development endeavor. I hope this will help you gain a better understanding of China. In a history that spans more than five millennia, the Chinese nation has contributed significantly to the progress of human civilization. But its course of national development has been a torturous one. In particular, in the 160 years and more since the Opium War in 1840, the Chinese people have fought courageously and unyieldingly to rid themselves of poverty and backwardness and to realize national rejuvenation, thus profoundly changing the destiny of the Chinese nation. Ninety-five years ago, the Chinese people launched the revolution of 1911 that overthrew the feudal autocracy which had ruled China for several thousand years and opened the door to China's progress. Fifty-seven years ago, the Chinese people succeeded in winning liberation after protracted and hard struggle and founded New China, in which people became their own masters. Twenty-eight years ago, the Chinese people embarked upon the historic drive of reform opening up and modernization and have made phenomenal progress through unremitting efforts. Between 1978 and 2005, China's GDP grew from 147.3 billion US dollars to 2.2257 trillion US dollars. Its import and export went up from 20.6 billion US dollars to 1.4221 trillion US dollars. Its foreign exchange reserve soared from 167 million US dollars to 818.9 billion US dollars. During this period, the number of its poor rural population dropped from 250 million to 23 million. The above review of the profound changes in these 160 years shows one thing, namely, by carrying out persistent and hard struggle, the Chinese people have both changed their own destiny and advanced the cause of human progress. On the other hand, I need to point out that despite the success in its development, China remains the world's largest developing country with per capita GDP ranking behind the 100th place. The Chinese people are yet to live a well-off life and China still faces daunting challenges in its development endeavor. Therefore, it requires s sustained and unremitting efforts to transform the country and make life better for the people. In the next 15 years, we will strive to make new progress in building a moderately prosperous society in an all-round way that will benefit China's one billion and more population. We aim to raise China's GDP to four trillion US dollars by 2020, averaging $3,000 per person. By then, China's economy will be better developed its democracy will be further enhanced. More progress will be made in science and education. Its culture will be further enriched, and the society will become more harmonious, and people will lead a better life. 
To realize these goals, China has adopted a new concept of development in line with its national conditions and the requirement of the times, that is, to pursue a scientific outlook on development that makes economic and social development people-oriented, comprehensive, balanced, and sustainable. We will work to strike a proper balance between urban and rural development, development among regions, economic and social development, development of man and nature, and domestic development and opening wider to the outside world. Greater emphasis will be put on addressing issues affecting people's livelihood, overcoming imbalances in development, and resolving key problems that have occurred in the course of development. We will pursue a new path to industrialization featuring high technology, good economic returns, low resource consumption, low environment pollution, and full use of human resources. We will bring about coordinated economic, political, cultural, and social development. And we will endeavor to ensure sustainable development by boosting production, improving people's life, and protecting the environment. This concept of scientific development is based on the experience China has gained in its modernization drive and put forth in response to the trends of the times. It is also rooted in the cultural heritages of the Chinese nation. The Chinese civilization is one that has continued uninterrupted for more than 5,000 years. The distinct cultural tradition of the Chinese nation that developed in the long course of history has exerted a strong influence on contemporary China, just as it did on ancient China. Putting people first, keeping pace with the times, maintaining social harmony, and pursuing peaceful development these values that are being pursued in China today are derived from its tradition, but they also give expression to the progress of the times. The Chinese civilization has always given prominence to the people and respect for people's dignity and value. Centuries ago, the Chinese already pointed out that, quote, People are the foundation of a country. When the foundation is stable, the country is in peace, end of quote. Quote, nothing is more valuable in the universe than human beings, end of quote. The ancient Chinese emphasized the value of serving the people, enriching them, nourishing them, and benefiting them. We are pursuing today a people-oriented approach towards development because we believe that development must be for the people and by the people and its benefit should be shared among the people. We care about people's value, rights and interests and freedom, the quality of their life, their development potential and happiness index because our goal is to realize the all-round development of the people. Ensuring the right to survival and development remains China's top priority. We will vigorously promote social and economic development, protect people's freedom, democracy, and human rights according to law, achieve social fairness and justice, and enable the 1.3 billion Chinese people to live a happy life. The Chinese civilization has always given prominence to unremitting self-improvement, reform, and innovation. 
As an ancient Chinese motto puts it, quote, as heaven keeps vigor through movement, a gentleman should unremittingly practice self-improvement, end of quote. Throughout its 5,000-year history, it is thanks to their perseverance, determination, stamina, and innovation that the Chinese nation has grown after surviving numerous setbacks and adversity. The Chinese people have shown enterprising spirits in reform and opening up. Creativity in national development and great ten tenacity in overcoming difficulties and road to progress. And all this gives expression to the spirit of unremitting self-improvement embodied in China's cultural tradition. The Chinese civilization has always given prominence to social harmony, unity, and mutual assistance. Back in the early days of the Chinese nation, the Chinese always advocated that, quote, harmony is most valuable, end of quote. They strove for harmony between man and nature, among people, and between the body and the soul, and yearned for an ideal society where, quote, everyone loves everyone else, everyone is equal, and the whole world is one community, end of quote. Today, China is endeavoring to build a harmonious society. It is a society of democracy and rule of law, fairness and justice, fraternity and integrity, vitality and stability, order and harmony between man and nature. It is a society where there is unity between the material and the spirit, democracy and the rule of law, fairness and efficiency, and vitality and order. The Chinese people takes the maintenance of ethnic unity and harmony as their bounden duty and the defense of the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity their sacred mission. Any act that promotes ethnic harmony and national unity will receive the warm welcome and support of the Chinese people. On the other hand, any act that undermines China's ethnic harmony and national unity will meet their strong opposition and resistance. The Chinese civilization has always given prominence to good neighborliness. The Chinese nation cherishes peace In foreign relations, the Chinese have always believed that, quote, the strong should not oppress the weak and the rich should not bully the poor, end of quote, and advocated that, quote, all nations live side by side in perfect harmony, end of quote. The Chinese held that, quote, one should be as inclusive as the ocean, which is vast because it admits hundreds of rivers, end of quote, and called for drawing upon the strength of others. Today, China holds high the banner of peace, development, and cooperation. It pursues an independent foreign policy of peace and commits itself firmly to peaceful development. It seeks to accelerate its development by upholding world peace. The world peace is in turn enhanced by China's development. China firmly pursues a strategy of opening up for mutual benefit and win-win outcomes. It genuinely wishes to enter into extensive cooperation with other countries. It is inclusive and is eager to draw on the strength of other civilizations to pursue peace and development through cooperation and play its part in building a harmonious world of enduring peace and common prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, 
China and the United States are both countries of vast territory where many ethnic groups coexist and different cultures intermingle. Both our two peoples are hardworking and talented. Due to different historical backgrounds and national conditions, there are differences between China and the United States. But this enables us to learn from each other and draw on each other's strength. Closer China-US cooperation serves the fundamental interests of our two countries and peoples and is also of far-reaching significance for peace and development of the whole world. Vast as it is, the Pacific Ocean has not stood in the way of exchanges and cooperation between our two peoples over the past 200 years. And many moving episodes of mutual learning and mutual help between our two peoples who represent different civilizations have been recorded. In the 27 years since the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1979, China-U.S. relations have maintained steady momentum of growth despite twists and turns on the way, bringing tremendous benefits to both countries and peoples. Entering the 21st century, the world has continued to undergo profound changes. Peace and development remain the calling of our times. On the other hand, factors causing instability and uncertainty are increasing and new challenges and threats are looming. Against this backdrop, the common interests between our two countries are increasing and the areas of our cooperation widening. Global peace and security now face new challenges, such as fighting international terrorism, preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, protecting the environment and human habitat, and combating transnational crimes. It is exactly in these fields that we share important strategic interests. China has a huge market, and its development has generated strong demand, while the United States has advanced technology and high-quality products. This has created enormous opportunities for economic and technical cooperation between our two countries. Indeed, there is a broad prospect for the growth of constructive and cooperative China-U.S. relations in all fields. Yesterday morning, President Bush and I had an in-depth exchange of views on China-U.S. relations and major international and regional issues of common interest and reached the broad and important agreement. We are both of the view that the two sides should approach our relations from a strategic and long-term perspective, and that we should enhance dialogue, expand common ground, increase mutual trust, deepen cooperation, and promote the all-round growth of the constructive and cooperative China-U.S. relations in the 21st century. When we focus on the overall interests of China-U.S. relations, respect and show understanding to each other. I am confident that our relations will move ahead in a healthy and a steady manner and contribute to the well-being of our two peoples and bring greater hope to people around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, a composer cannot write enchanting melody with one note, and a painter cannot paint landscape with only one color. The world is a treasure house where the unique cultural achievement created by people of all countries are displayed. The culture of a nation tells a lot about the evolution of the nation's understanding of the world and life, both past and present. Culture thus embodies a nation's fundamental pursuit of the mind and dictates its norms of behavior. The historical process of human development is one in which different civilizations interact with and enrich each other, and all civilizations in human history have contributed 
to human progress in their own unique way. Cultural diversity is a basic feature of both human society and today's world, and an important driving force for human progress. As history has shown, in the course of interactions between civilizations, we not only need to remove natural barriers and overcome physical isolation, we also need to remove obstacle and obstruction of the mind and overcome various prejudices and misunderstanding. Differences in ideology, social system and development model should not stand in the way of exchanges among civilizations. Still less should they become excuses for mutual confrontation. We should uphold the diversity of the world, enhance dialogue and interaction between civilizations, and draw upon each other's strength instead of practicing mutual exclusion. When this is done, mankind will enjoy greater harmony and happiness, and the world will become a more colorful place to live in. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, exchanges in culture and education and among young people serve as a bridge for increasing mutual understanding between our two peoples. They are also a major driving force for the healthy and stable growth of China-U.S. relations. Yale is a forerunner in conducting China-U.S. educational exchanges and provides an important platform for cultural exchanges between our two countries. 156 years ago, a Chinese young man named Rong Hong entered Yale campus. Four years later, he graduated with distinction and received a Bachelor of Arts degree, making him the first ever Chinese graduate of an American university. Later, Group after group of young Chinese followed his footsteps and studied in Yale. Over the past 20 years, Yale has admitted over 4,000 Chinese students and undertaken more than 80 cooperation projects in culture, science and technology, and education with China. Last summer, Yale sent the first group of students to China for internships, and some among them became the first foreign interns to work with China's Palace Museum. I wish to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to Mr. Levin and Yale for the efforts you have made to promote exchanges between our two peoples. To enhance mutual understanding between young people and educators of the two countries, I announce with pleasure here that we have decided to invite 100 Yale faculty members and students to visit China this summer. I'm sure you can look forward to an enjoyable experience in China. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as an old Chinese saying goes, as in the Yangtze River, where the waves behind drive on those before, so a new generation always excels the last one. Young people represent the hope and future of the world. They are full of vitality, new ideas, and creativity. I sincerely hope that the young people in China and the United States will join hands and work to enhance the friendship between our two peoples, and together with people of other countries, create a better world for all. Thank you.
Mr. President, thank you so much for that enlightening speech, for, for explaining China's recent development in terms of its history, and for expressing such optimism about the future of China's uh, peaceful rise. We, um, we're especially grateful for your marvelous gift of 100 uh, invitations to faculty and students, and we, I know that many of our students and faculty will take this up with great delight, so thank you so much. <clears throat>主席先生，呃，感谢您刚才的讲话，而且我非常高兴听从你的讲话中得到很多启发。从另外呢，也学到很多关于中国近代历史上的发展，以及您对我们两国关系未来的乐观。我尤其感谢您向我们发出这样的
有没有同样的就不同的意见？美国到底对中国是意味着什么？就是在这个迅速发展的市场中，我美国也是代表什么呢？ Sadina 先生啊，是我的老朋友。President Sadio is an old friend of mine. 他刚才提这个呃，代表在座的各位啊，提出的这个问题啊，呃，我非常愿意给大家做出回答。I'm more than willing to answer this question raised by him on behalf of all of you. 刚才我在演讲当中啊，已经谈到，改革开放以来，中国坚持走了一条和平发展的道路。对内，我们坚持以经济建设为中心，聚精会神搞建设，一心一意谋发展。在发展中不断改善人民的生活。对外，我们坚持独立自主的和平外交政策，坚持维护世界和平，促进共同发展。As I said in the speech delivered just now, ever since China's reform and opening up, China has embarked on a Path of peaceful development. On the domestic front, China has focused on economic development. We have concentrated our energy and resources wholeheartedly on economic growth, and we have also tried to constantly improve the lives of the Chinese people in the development process. On the external front, China has always pursued an independent foreign policy of peace. And we have always tried our best to safeguard world peace and promote common development. 二十八年来，中国的经济社会发展啊，确实取得了很大的成就。中国的经济实现了年均百分之九点六的增长。这不仅改变了中国人民的命运，也为世界的发展提供了宝贵的机遇。Over the past 28 years, it is indeed the truth that China's economy and society have registered tremendous achievements. On an average basis, China's economy has grown by 9.6 percent a year. And this has changed the fate of the Chinese people, and indeed, this has also presented a valuable opportunity for the growth of the world at large. But we should also see that, although China's economy is growing, but China has 13 million people. Every year, China's economy grows by 9.6 percent. 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 都会是一个很小的数字。This being said, we must see that although China has become comparatively speaking stronger, it still has a population of 1.3 billion. Any figure, no matter how large it is, divided by 1.3 billion will become a small one. 我刚才谈到。中国的人均国内生产总值还只有一千七百美元，在世界各国当中还排在一百位以后。我们在经济社会发展的进程当中，还存在着许多矛盾和问题，需要我们集中精力去加以解决。因此啊，我们啊非常希望。As I said in the speech, the per capita GDP of China now stands at merely 1,700 U.S. dollars, making China ranking behind the 100th place in the world. In the process of economic and social development, we also encounter 
many complex problems and difficulties. We need to concentrate our energy and resources on resolving those problems and meeting the challenges. That's why we hope to see a peaceful international environment. 中国仍将继续坚定不移地走和平发展道路。中国的发展不会影响任何人，也不会威胁任何人。中国的发展是世界各国发展的宝贵机遇。我们希望和大家一起做合作的伙伴。will continuously stay firmly on the course of peaceful development. China's development will not compromise the interests of anyone, nor will China's development threaten anyone. China's development actually will present valuable opportunities for the growth of other countries as well, and China always stands ready to become partners of peace with other countries. As for the China-U.S. relationship, both China and the United States are countries of significant influence in today's world. And both countries show the important responsibilities for world peace and common development. Against the new international backdrop, China and the United States share extensive common strategic interests. Our two countries should, should not only be stakeholders, all the more we should also become parties of constructive cooperation. I believe that I'm sure this view of mine will certainly win the support and endorsement of the Chinese people and the American people. Thank you, Mr. President. Although you honor me with your friendship and I admire you a lot, I have to make a harder question to you. <laughs> 主席先生, 感谢您, 而且虽然您把我当作朋友, 我感到非常荣幸, <laughs> uh, the impressive economic growth of by China over the last quarter of a century would be unthinkable without the economic freedom brought about by reforms initiated in 1978 by the Chinese leadership. There is always the question of whether or not a system that allows economic freedom while restricting political freedom will encounter serious problems of social unrest in the long run. Is this a concern for the Chinese government? Does the Chinese leadership have a strategy to enhance human rights, civil liberties, and religious freedom in China? Thank you. Uh, China, in the past 25 years, the growth of the economy in 发起的经济改革是不可思议的那么我想请问这是会使人想起一个体制如果是允许有经济自由但是同时有约束政治自由会不会遇到许多严重的社会不稳定就是长远的社会不稳定的问题这是否中国政府所关心的一个问题呢中
有没有一个对策来改善人权、这个和民权和宗教自由呢？这个，我也希望，呃，塞林德先生啊，给我提问题的时候啊，不要手下留情。I also shared hope that when raising the question, my friend will give no mercy to me. Transparently, I am a pragmatist. I believe that the development of the high rise 要适应经济基础发展的要求。To be frank with you, I'm a materialist, a Marxist. Actually, I believe that actually the development of the political infrastructure must be compatible with the economic foundation. 我也认为，没有民主，就没有现代化。I also believe there is no modernization without democracy. 但是呢，如果把中国二十八年来经济社会发展所取得的成就，仅仅归结于中国进行了经济体制的改革，这显然是不全面的，也是不完全符合实际的。But I don't think it is a factual approach or fair to say that uh, the economic and social achievements China has scored over the past 28 years are merely attributing to the economic reforms. The fact is that uh, since the year 1978, China has carried out reforms on the economic, political, cultural, and other fronts. 凡是对中国有比较深入了解的人，就会得出这样的结论。无论是在经济体制改革方面，还是在政治体制改革方面，中国都取得了重要成果。For someone who has a more in-depth understanding of China, he, will, he or she will easily come to the conclusion that be it in the field of economic reforms or in the field of political restructuring, China has indeed scored important achievements. 二十多年来，中国经济持续快速发展的事实，也表明中国的政治体制是基本适应中国经济发展的需要的。And I think over the past more than twenty years, the sustained and rapid economic development in China in itself. Has demonstrated the fact that China's political system suits its economic development. 今后啊，我们仍将根据中国的国情和中国人民的意愿，积极稳妥地推进政治体制改革，发展社会主义民主。In the future. We will continue to make efforts in the light of China's national conditions and the will of the Chinese people to actively, prudently, and appropriately move forward the political restructuring and develop the socialist democracy. We will continue to strengthen the democratic way, to expand the democratic participation. Yeah, she's 
依法治国的方略，保障公民依法实行民主选举、民主决策、民主管理、民主监督。In the future, we will continue to make efforts to further enrich the formats of democracy and expand the orderly participation in the political field by our Chinese citizens. And we are also going to further implement the strategy of running the country according to law. We will continue our efforts to ensure that the Chinese citizens could better exercise their rights of democratic election, democratic decision making. Democratic management and democratic supervision, as provided for in the law. We are willing to take foreign policy experience, but we will not On one hand, we are ready and willing to draw upon the useful experience of foreign countries in the field of political development. On the other hand, we will not simply copy the political models of other countries. 好，请赛琳娜先生继续。